Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our second webinar of 2021. We are so excited to have all of you here from our customers, prospects, SAP, uh, and our team here at Bramasol to discuss a great topic, understanding commissions accounting in the ASC 606 framework. Um, so we're gonna get into that in just a moment, but for, now, I'd like to remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded so that you can go back and download, uh, share with your colleagues, et cetera. Um, please feel free to uh, ask any questions throughout this session. There's a panel right here on the uh, user panel. You can send the question privately or send it to all. We love your questions, so feel free to do that. And then, of course, you can download previous webinars uh, you can do that from bramasol.com. Uh, you can go in, check out all of our new content. We have some great new content that we're starting to curate around many of these subjects from not just Bramasol, but other companies as well. Uh, check us out on Facebook and LinkedIn on our uh, company pages. Uh, you can go to YouTube and view our uh, videos. We have oh, about uh, almost almost 100 uh, webinar videos, and we have uh, several dozen other kinds of videos and things that you can link to there. Uh, and you can check out our podcasts and videos also through Apple iTunes and iHeartRadio. So today we have a packed, what is a, it looks like a very packed agenda, but we have a pretty packed agenda. Uh, but we're focusing today on uh, commissions accounting. We'll talk a little bit about the challenging areas now we're going to hone in and focus in on this idea of commissions accounting. It's come up in a number of different places, and we have uh, what we think is a, a great solution to helping companies just like yours um, really manage and solve those challenges under um, SAP RAR. So before I dive into <clears throat> the actual meat of the, the talk, let me introduce our speakers today, uh, Julio de la Costa. Uh, is part of our digital services team. He is our director of technical accounting and leads our business areas uh, for analytics and accounting and technical accounting advisory. Uh, good afternoon, Julio, and welcome. Good afternoon, John. Nice to be here. It is, as always, great to have you here. Um, today, we also have a great uh, speaker, Shekhar Chowdhury. Uh, Shekhar is a member of our revenue accounting uh, center of expertise um, and is uh, probably, not probably, <clears throat> we think one of the leading experts on revenue accounting and certainly revenue accounting using SAP RAR. And <clears throat> we're delighted, uh, Shaker, that you could join us for an hour to talk about this subject since you uh, kind of developed this solution uh, and took some time out from working with our big, one of our big customers to join us. Thank you and welcome, Shaker. Thank you, John. And <laughs> All right. So with that in mind, so, you know, we have done um, well over almost 100 projects so far uh, in the areas of RAR, and we've spoken to uh, hundreds of customers, whether they're prospects or in user groups, uh, technical forums, etc. And we've really narrowed down to five main topics of challenge. Uh, and the first one that we'll talk for a moment about is this idea of allocation of goods and services into performance obligations. And we see this um, as our customers really are looking at um, the issues and challenges around the fact that maybe they have all complied, but they're not uh, managing the processes in an optimal way. They wanna optimize those processes. And one of those spaces is allocation of goods and services. Um, Julio, maybe you can talk for a moment about that topic and and share with our folks, you know, what what we're seeing out there. Yeah, I, just John. So I think from our perspective, a lot of our projects, I think the first challenge that people see is really the allocation of the goods and services into performance obligations. As a result of 606, what you what you have now is this, is this mandate where you have these multiple element arrangements. And now you have to basically allocate those uh, goods and services into performance obligations. And that sometimes can be tricky, especially in the new economy of subscription revenue accounting, where you basically have goods, you have services, 
you have warranties, you also have things such as maintenance. So the actual act of taking that sales order, and you may have 15 or 16 or 25 different line items, and now pushing them into, is this a performance obligation that could stand on its own, or is this line item part of a bigger performance obligation? So those are some of the challenges that we see our customers having. Absolutely, and maybe Shaker, you can comment for a moment, because, um, and particularly around the integration or the issues and challenges we see with regard to uh, sales orders and what's on a sales order versus what has to be allocated. And I, I call to mind or it comes to mind a couple of different uh, scenarios that we've recently dealt with uh, a large, uh, a well-known software company that makes software that we know, uh, games actually, that we know very, very well. Uh, and has issues over um, you know, selling a package that then has not only parent, you know, there's a parent, there's a child and grandchild, uh, and that doesn't always show up. Or you have um, one of the large companies that we're dealing with uh, that has a lot of these, we sell a SKU, a large SKU or a large bundle of uh, services, but underneath that are um, hundreds of different SKUs that fit in and it may be available to that customer uh, or the one that you're currently working on uh, around some of those issues. So, you know, maybe you can comment for a moment on some of those. We are going to do uh, a follow-on um, webinar about this topic because a number of our customers have asked about that. So, but maybe you can touch yeah. on it real quick, some of the, the things you're seeing, Shaker. That's correct, John, because the reason behind this is because our sales and distribution processes are pretty matured and uh, there is lots of customization done for in every industry sector to match their processes right uh, readily uh, i mean uh, every day there is new uh involvement uh, the processes are evolved and that's how we do the customization in our standard sales and distribution processes and in order to uh, and that same data goes into aria right so, so in order to match that customization and the data quality which comes in aria the, the, then we face lots of challenges in aria how to tackle those customized applications of operational systems right. and then we have to adjust our data in uh, aria to do the correct allocations between goods and services and different bundles and different components of the sales order right absolutely Perfect, and and you know as 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 we've done these and do more of them, we we certainly develop our own IP. And again, we'll do a uh, a follow-on webcast or webinar about this, and I encourage you all to uh, check that out. Another one, uh, Julio, that we often run into, and and Shaker, you're from, you know, we're all familiar with, is standalone selling price. And how do you manage that process, um, Julio? Maybe you can can uh, talk about some of the experience we've had there quickly. Yeah, so. This, this, this is a very particular one because I'm, I'm, I think from our customer base and our projects we've been doing the last three years, in probably every project because what what really the guidance is requesting is you know we we used to have something called VSOP which is the, you know the standalone price you know vendor specific objective evidence VSOE which is basically what is in new term standalone selling price. And somehow, when you have these 25 different uh, line items on a sales order, you have to now say, okay, what is the price? What is the standalone selling price of this good or item? And it's not just the price on your sales order. It's actually, you have to do a historical analysis. What companies are using the historical analysis, but there's other methodologies where you can use industry averages, you can use what you expect to sell. So I think this has been one of the challenges of companies where they're trying to automate this process. And what we have seen, the most, the, I guess the most simplistic way to, to automate this process, instead of having to do a download every time you change your prices, is to look at your historical prices. So I let Shaker go into some more detail on that. Shaker? Yeah. Um, so in this in this case, the SSP determination uh, for every component is different uh, business to business, right? Uh, depends on how the accounting team uh, decides what approach should be followed, and that's the challenge here for every, right. uh, because the process of determination of SSP could be different. 
and it depends on the industry sector and how we, how the pricing structure we offer to every customer and right. the customer segment. Yeah, and we built a tool for that. And again, if you check it out, we have some uh, information uh, videos and posts on that. So check that out. Um, one of my favorite subjects has been for a long time variable consideration. Um, you know, most likely an expected value approaches, um, but also how do you deal with cumulative catch-ups? How do you deal with consumption models? How do you deal with collectability and all of those? And maybe Julio, just a quick thought on that. Yeah, very quickly, John. So, variable consideration is one of my, I guess, kind of go straight to my heart because it's one of the new uh, considerations in sector six. And, you know, you're required from an accounting perspective to estimate these things. In the old days, you would wait until it was appropriate to book that adjustment. Now, you basically have to do it from, you know, from basically day one. So that is something that is companies are trying to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. cool. All right, and Shaker, any thoughts on that? I know we do a lot around that that spot. Exactly, because this variable consideration is not. I mean, we cannot do the uh, out of the box solutioning for variable consideration since the name itself suggests that it's variable, right? So it's uh, for every industry. Uh, whatever estimates are there for the uh, ch changes right in the on the transaction that we have to estimate initially and then we have to adjust the transaction price so the challenge is how we are going to predict those changes up uh, in the cycle so that's that's the challenge and how we can uh, right. adopt that into uh, revenue accounting to determine our transaction prices right and leveraging tools like brf plus and other tools on the front end to help them set up some, a set of rules that look at it, right? Exactly, some customization, some additional line items defining in the sales order, can, we can tackle those requirements of variable considerations. Okay, plus doing some adjustment in the transaction price determination in the sales uh, operational transaction also can help. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, another great one that we all love, of course, is uh, contract combinations, contract modifications. Uh, and so, you know, that's another space where we see a lot of um, customers struggling with today using spreadsheets, using other tools. How do you integrate that together? Uh, and, you know, what are some of those issues and challenges that they see uh, out there? And I know, you know, obviously, you know, RAR was built uh, from the ground up to allow you to automate and simplify those contract modifications. We have some straightforward processes. There are decisions around prospective and retrospective, but maybe Shaker, you know, um, you know, just make a comment about the fact that, you know, a lot of this is automated, but there are some other considerations, right? Yeah, that's correct. So there, there are some inbuilt uh, decision points we have built in RAR and it's very um, complex determination SAP has provided now in the recent releases with the change types and then how the change results uh, reasons so we can we have the uh, audit trail also maintained there so we have uh, sap is providing some additional information how what are the reasons and mm -hmm. what is the treatment rar is doing to determine this prospective versus retrospective so it's uh, yeah so it's additional functionalities are being provided in let, uh, recent releases now so absolutely Absolutely. And, and and one question that came up, and thank you for that question, um, and maybe Julio, you can comment on it, both from, from this perspective, but primarily from the variable consideration, and we're going to talk about this in a moment as it relates to commissions accounting, obviously, uh, is a portfolio approach, right? And, and Julio, um, maybe you can comment uh, on um, the the variable consideration aspects of that, and then we'll dive right into our commissions accounting. Yes, John. You can hear me now, John? Much better. Thank you. Yes. So the portfolio approach was something that the FASB came out just to make adoption a bit easier. So the portfolio approach entails looking at a series of similar type contracts as, as, as one contract. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? That means that you look at your population and you pick out similarities. So instead of having 10,000, 
you maybe have to now deal for the accounting of 10 or 15. Right. Same thing we'll talk about about commissions accounting, it's the same approach. When you talk about the commissions accounting, it's looking at the portfolio approach as well versus looking at you know individual skills or a level. All right. Well, let's let's you know we've we're here to talk about that. So let's dive right in, Julio. I'll turn this uh, over from your perspective. There's some some changes in the way uh, we're addressing uh, commissions accounting and uh, driving our customers to really have to begin to look at this. So I'll um, I'll I'll turn the turn the uh, steering wheel over to you. Yes, John. So thank you. So I think from our perspective, you know, when ASC 606 came out, everybody was focused on the revenue side of it. And it was a big change. It has been a big change. It continues to be a big challenge for many companies. But I think what, what people have, have, you know, focused on until recently was, you know, a lot of companies, mostly every company who actually does revenue accounting, also has a sales plan, a commissions accounting plan, and that also changed from the aspect in the mm -hmm. ASC 6 and IFRS 15. So this is what we're here to talk about today. So accounting for commissions is actually an expense side. So it has right. changed because it has filtered into what we talk about ASC 340-40, which has been released in conjunction with ASC 606. Right. And these costs to obtain are not, you know, we're going to focus on commissions, but there are a lot of other mm -hmm. aspects to um, costs to obtain, including what we'll talk a little bit about later on uh, in February is project accounting and some of the costs to obtain in, in there. But um, yeah. Yes. So there were there were two main aspects of cost accounting when it comes to revenue accounting, which is cost to obtain and cost to fulfill. So the cost to obtain is what we're focused on today. The cost to obtain is basically has to be an incremental cost, not something like a marketing expense that you would have had anyway. It has to be something that has been heard specifically directly relates to the accounting for this revenue contract, which in many cases, in probably a majority of cases, would be commissions. So basically, you have a salesperson, they go out, they sell a... a good or service or what have you and that is a direct incremental cost of that revenue accounting contract yeah and i think maybe you can comment as to we had an interesting call you and i earlier this morning about uh this um from from the media perspective right yes exactly so you know it's funny i was thinking the same thing so you know <laughs> from our perspective you know, people get confused when you have an incremental cost versus an uh, 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 indirect cost. So it's very important that companies delineate between something that impacts a direct contract to something that you would have expensed anyway, which is usually what we in the accounting world call SGA expense, sales general administrative uh, cost. So that's very important to delineate as you go through this process. Absolutely. And our, our client this morning, we were talking about uh, media and television production and the difference between the actual production uh, and the costs associated with producing a TV show and, and um, you know, giving it to a, an, a, a, a network, if you will, versus the uh, promotion and advertising expenses. So absolutely. Right. All right. Yeah. And just, just to finish up this, this, this thing is, as we said before, an incremental cost is something that really would would only have happened if you have that contract. So if I work in marketing and we won a contract, well, there's, there's, there's a good chance that my marketing or sales costs would have already incurred anyway. But because of this, I now have to pay somebody a commission. That's a direct incremental cost. And just as a FYI, there is a practical expedient involved. So many companies have taken that expedient, which means that if you have a commission expense that is less than one year amortization period, you're allowed to continue expensing that over the time frame. Okay, that's great. But you know, as you and I both know in this new subscription economy where these uh, are often um, multi-year sales, multi-year subscriptions, you know, software as a service is a great example. Um, we're seeing more and more of the multi-years, right? So. Absolutely. Yeah. And then that is what I think, you know, 
based on our observation of our projects, that is why companies are becoming more familiar and asking for help on, you know, I have all these multi-year sales contracts. Well, guess what? Now I can't just expense it one time. I have to now put it on my balance sheet and expense it over the life of that revenue contract. So it Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about sales commissions under NRevRec. Yep. So if you think about the the 606 process, we have these sales contracts coming in. We talked a little bit about how we would assimilate the goods and services into performance obligations. It's part of the five-step revenue model. But then as you as you allocate these goods and services into performance obligations, and then you say, okay, what is my what is my expected time frame to recognize this revenue? Well, the answer now goes, it depends because it depends on, you have to look at the revenue contract that you're tying it to. So there is an allocation of the commission's contract into the revenue performance obligation. So in the old days, before this 606 was, was made mandatory, many companies, most companies would simply expense. You have a commission expense, your debit expense, your credit cash, the sales, uh, the sales AE, they get their commissions and you move on with life. Now, even though you're paying commissions maybe to that AE in a certain month, how you expense it is very different. So now we have this, I always like to use the word bifurcation between mm -hmm. how you're paying commissions and how you're expensing commissions because before they were all the same, one, more or less they were one and the same. Now they're bifurcated because I may pay commissions in April, but if I have a five-year contract, I have to now expense that expense over that five-year period. So it's very different accounting now. Absolutely, absolutely. And then talk about this idea of the report that intangible assets, right? Yes. So for the most part, what companies have done is when, you, when you're crediting your P&L, which is you're essentially moving your expense onto the balance sheet, you're creating an intangible expense, right? You're creating an intangible expense for that specific revenue contract. Where it gets challenging is, and we'll talk about this shortly in the next couple of slides, is what about companies who have multiple different uh, commission plans? Right. Well, then what you're forced to do is start uh, calculating and capturing these costs in different buckets. That right. can be very tedious and challenging for many companies. That's why they're looking for ways to automate this process. Yeah, and 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 by the way, from a reporting perspective and a per, you know a certain perspective, you know if you back off from it, right? Um, you know something that was very much it's very much you know Julio as as we've discussed a lot like the leasing standards, right? You've taken something that was ostensibly an expense related item. That was just pure expense, just like a lease was pure expense in the past. And now you've said, uh, 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 wait a minute, some of that is actually an asset or a liability. You must now move not not just from the P and L perspective, but now it has an effect again yet on the balance sheet. And so, you know, there's also these fundamental differences on uh, our our basic financial statements, right? Actually, John, that's, that's a really good point, something I didn't think about. Um, it's exactly like leasing, where leasing used to just go through the P&L. Now you have a, 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 a three-step process, right? You've got to take it out of the P&L, put it on the balance sheet, and then re-expense it accordingly. So yeah, it's a very similar, good, it's a very good analogy for people. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the changes. Yep. Um, so... This is a very simple example that I wanted to talk about. So what you see on the screen here for you know folks in the accounting department or folks who understand the accounting, this is this is what you would this is what you're accustomed to. You're accustomed to basically looking at your commission. You've encountered a, a sale a revenue project, you know, and you've won that project. As a result, now you have a commission plan. You have to pay that 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 salesperson their commission. So basically, you would you know book that commission on your profit and loss statement as a debit to your commission expense, and credit to your cash or your accounts payable. This is very important because 
you know, in, in pre-606, even though that commission expense may have been related to a, a, a multi-year project, you know, it was generally accepted that you could have just expensed it. That, that, was, right. the, that, that was the simple, simple accounting treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now the new process. So now, if you follow my, my previous slide, which basically gave you the accounting adjustment, um, the, the accounting, the initial entry, which was debit my commission expense and credit my, uh, uh, my cash. Well, there's two more entries now. The second entry that we're going to do is we are going to create this asset called commission payable, which, which sounds like a, something that should be on your liability side back in the old days, right? Because that would be right. what you normally have as your commissions payable on your liability side. Well, no, this is an asset. This is what we talked about earlier, which is what we call the commissions payable intangible asset. So what am I doing? I'm creating this asset because I'm reversing the commission's expense that I just took from the previous entry. So in my old, my in the previous example, I booked $36 of expense on the balance on, on my PL and I credited my cash. My cash still stays intact because I still have to pay my salesperson. What I'm doing now in my second adjustment is I'm actually taking that out of my PL. So I'm reversing the entire entry as credit to my sales commission. So in my second entry, my PL has a zero impact as of now, and I'm debiting my intangible asset, my, my commission's payable asset. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody's going to tell me, well, Julio, you know, you still have to account for your commission's payable on your expense uh, PL. And the answer is yes. But now I'm only doing 136th of that expense. So now in my third entry, which you see at the bottom of your screen is, I will now have, I'm, because my assumption is I have a 36 month revenue contract. So for this month, I only have to have one 36th expense. So basically what I did in summary is, initially I booked my 36 month entry on my P&L. Then mm -hmm. I reversed that, put that 36 month expense on my balance sheet. Now, to correctly match my expenses with the revenue, I am doing 136 of com commission expense. So if you think about what I just did, John, I have basically removed 35 months of expense right. from my P&L, put it on my balance sheet. So if somebody is looking at EBITDA, EBITDA actually increases as a result of right. 6 a lot of companies like to hear that because now it <laughs> slows down your, your, your expensing. So instead of doing 100%, I'm actually doing 136 every month. So in some regards, at the end of that year, they will have you know, 12 months of expense rather than 36 months of expense, which is actually good. Well, in theory, for that year, because you have reduced expenses because I'm spreading it out over the revenue contract. Right. And the purpose of that, as I understand from talking with you and others, uh, is, you know, as we think of the standard ASC 606 process for revenue recognition itself, the idea was to begin to was to match the recognition of revenue to when uh, the customer takes control. Right. They have that POB when they get the value, if you will, from that POB. And now what we're saying is logically you're now matching the corresponding commission expense or the expense to the recognition of that revenue and thus that's why they they kind of went this way and said hey wait a minute but you need a place to store the value and we're going to store that value on the balance sheet right exactly john john i mean you know i know you're a cpa in training so it, you, you, i couldn't <laughs> any, any better perfect Good. honorary cpa thank you thank you all right so let's talk about the process, a beautiful eight step chart. Oh, eight steps. Huh? So, you know, if you think about what the process looks like today, you know, mm -hmm. so let, let's be very clear here. What you're seeing on the screen is the portfolio approach. So under, under the 606 guidance for commissions accounting, there is uh, an expedient that allows you 
to really look at, you know, commissions, plans as a portfolio. It's very important because a, big, a large company, many companies, especially telecoms, there's multiple sales plans for different products, different services. So what the FASB did allow is to allow the portfolio approach, which means that I am going to do the following eight steps. So the first step is obviously understanding each of the compensation plans, which takes a long time, but it's the best foundation to have when you think about understanding how to do the commission expense correctly. The next step is going to be understanding is how you bucket your commissions into portfolios. So what is a portfolio? A portfolio is really finding similar similarities in, in, in plans. So what we find in practice is you may have 100 different plans, but in reality, you really have 10 plans that are, are targeted towards a specific product you're selling, a specific service. And even though the percentages may be different, the, the methodology of, of commissions for this product is very similar. So then you're allowed to actually bucket it into that portfolio. So basically, that, 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 that's the second step. The third step is really understanding, is there an incremental cost in this commission plan? So again, we talked about a little bit about before, is you're going to have this, is it a marketing, a direct expense related to the revenue contract, or is it an indirect expense, which you would have had anyway? And again, if you look at the step four, it says the accrual timing does not change. Well, what does that mean? That means that essentially I am going to accrue and exactly what you said before, John, is you now have to match the expense to the revenue contract. So I'm going to accrue that, that commissions on my balance sheet accordingly and then expense it in accordance with that revenue contract. And that leads us into step five, which is going to be looking at the amortization period. The amortization period is going to come from that portfolio of revenue contracts. So again, we're always going back to accounting 101, where we're trying to match the revenue contract with the expense related, because it comes back to the matching principle, which is one of the fundamentals of any accounting program. We talk mm -hmm. about uh, fringe benefits. So as part of this exercise, you do have to take into consideration fringe benefits for that employee. So usually what we find is some companies are taking a percentage of fringe benefits into that direct expense calculation. So they're coming up with not just a commission expense, but also uh, like a 3% or 5% or 7% of those fringe benefits because that is considered part of the direct expense. The last two are really understanding, you know, from the multiple performance obligations within the contract, which one is allocated where. And then very importantly is you've done all the seven steps, but let's say you have a change in estimates. Let's say you know, you know, the company increases the payouts for this new product or the mm -hmm. payout decrease. Well, you have to have a process in place that's going to make sure that you're changing the estimates with the change in the products or services or the commission plans. Because at the end of the day, remember what we're doing, we are essentially capitalizing and expensing over a long period of time. So if you change the estimate, you may have to true up at the end of every period, and I think a, a, a best practice we have seen in our companies that do this do these projects is they do an, a, a true up allocation at the end of every quarter. Yeah, that's funny. I was going to ask you about that, so thank you. You know, it, 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 we've noticed when talking with our clients, obviously that um, you know, custom, you know, particularly in the world of uh, solutions. Uh, solutions economy where we have subscriptions or you have trials or you have uh, leasing, you know, you have cancellations. And so the, the, that, that not only changes the revenue associated with it, right? So these revenues, but it may also change the associated commissions uh, with that. And of course, in some scenarios you have, I paid you the commission. Now I have to reallocate that commission because I'm not getting that commission back maybe, right? 
uh, or you have scenarios in which no, I have to net out the commission and you lose that commission on that ongoing. Think of, you know, we look at some of these simple ones that we've, or not simple ones, we've talked about telco, um, but think about insurance too, right? That's a long-term contract and with multi-years. And when somebody cancels, you no longer get the commission on that uh, insurance policy. So it relates to lots of different uh, industries. And, and the netting out is a way to say, you know, we're not going to deal with it on an individual level. We're going to net it out, the change of estimates, right? Exactly. And I think that that's a very important point because you may have commission reversals, you may have true-ups, you may have increases, yeah. decreases. So, you know, totally. whether you're doing this on a automated basis or a manual basis, you have to make sure you have a process that's going to entail how do I deal with changes? Sure, absolutely. Well, wow, from, a, from an accounting perspective, that's really complicated. So, Shekhar, as the revenue accounting expert and the RAR expert, how do we make this happen? Talk us through, I think you've come, you and the team have come up with a great way to make this work. How does it happen? Yep, so whatever steps uh, Julio explained just now to us, we just try to uh, illustrate that uh, example. Uh, when, what process should we follow to put that solution in place? Uh, when we use ARIA as a application to do this amortization at portfolio level for this commission cost. So what we do is uh, this this uh, process will be run for every period since it is portfolio. We'll have to wait for that uh, month to complete all the operational transactions. Uh, so what we do is in that particular period, we'll see what are the total transactions and what is my total revenue. And we'll calculate and uh, in, basically in that report, we'll get what is the total commissions paid. That total commissions paid amount will be distributed into in, um, what is the rateable portion of that and what is the event-based POVs uh, of that particular uh, uh, total revenue actually. So we'll see the what is the total weightage of rateable versus event-based. Because event-based commission, we need not have to amortize. It is It can be straight away expensed out at, uh, as Julio said. Whatever commission is associated to my retable performance obligations, only that needs to be amortized. So that's what this in this example, this 70% that is 10,500 bucks is the uh, amount which I'll be interested in to amortize. So after that, um, depending on whatever parameter, different parameters, we can define the different portfolios for whole. Uh, all the rateable performance obligations. Why do we have to define different portfolio? Is because the average life of each of the portfolio might be different, and we may want different reporting for that each of the portfolio. So that's why, uh, depending on those requirements, we can define the number of portfolios actually. Based on uh, when we apply that percentage of that portfolio, means again this percentage of share. Uh, if you can see here on the second box, the percentage of share uh, of that each portfolio will again be determined through our uh, revenue reports, mm -hmm. and we can determine what is the actual amount to be amortized for each of the portfolio, and we get the average life also for that each portfolio. And using this information, we'll store all this information in one. Take, uh, table which we call uh, we can call it as a staging table in the prior to RAR process and using that information we can create the feed for RAR so basically in technical terms we can create order items and the invoice items for RAR and we can uh, capitalize that commission amount in the RAR by using our normal RAR processes like uh, uh, inbound processing, then contract management, and uh, the postings. So we can leverage the app, uh, application which we are already using for uh, revenue reporting. Same application we can leverage for this commissions accounting also. Sure, sure. Julio, talk if maybe you can talk for a moment, and then I'll ask. I'm going to ask you the the accounting side, and then Shaker, I'll I'll ask about your perspective on the how do we do this um, but 
how does this relate to the actual commissions paid, um, the actual dollar amounts of the commissions paid, Julio? Well, f first of all, John, I just want to make sure er everybody understands what exactly Shika is, 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 is doing here. And I think, I, I think from my perspective, from, an, from me being a, a, a lowly accountant, this is pretty amazing because he is actually using RAR, which is, was built to really look at you know, your revenue accounting, to actually manage an expense line item in your company's uh, portfolio. So, I mean, what is he doing? I mean, he is basically, if you go back to the previous slide and you look at the nine steps that we talked about, he has basically, him and, him and his team at Bramasol, they've basically taken those nine steps and automated it which is right. exactly what people are trying to do now because if you look at those nine steps you basically have to have somebody half fte or full fte especially in large companies doing this or maybe teams of people doing this on a full time basis because it's it it gets very uh, challenging when you have multiple level plans and you know commission plans that normally have multiple levels of payouts and and, and percentages and to me, the amazing thing is, you know, Shika and his team at Bramasol, they've actually automated this using right. not just another system, but actually using the same system that they're booking the, the revenues in. So I think that is nothing short of yeah. amazing. No, absolutely, Julio, and, and spot on, and thank you for emphasizing that. And I think what's really amazing is you have an automated, simplified um, process that aligns with your, you know, to your point, your revenue accounting processes, you know, right? So in the past, you you had to think about how would I marry up my RevRec process with my commissions accounting process in two different systems. But the point of what you're saying is, look, we've taken a tool that was ostensibly designed to help you manage your revenue accounting and, and manage the adjustments taken the power of that tool, leveraging other information from SAP or from tools like Exactly or others around commissions and said, now we can automate the process of aligning the commissions to the appropriate sets of POBs, to the appropriate timing of those POBs. And all of this is automated because of, of what we've done here. Absolutely. And I, I think I think that is the key, John. You asked a, a, a good question to me a couple of minutes ago, which is compare what is being paid to what is being expensed. And we talked about that a little bit before, which is essentially the expense is being bifurcated than the payment. So in, in the Bramasol tool, from Shika, correct me if I'm wrong, what they're doing is they're looking at what was paid and then they're, they're using that as their foundation so it could be from any other system exactly or whatever else is doing the commissions account, the commissions paid. And then they are now doing the allocation. RER is an excellent allocation tool. That's the reason why we have 606. And they're using the allocation to now reallocate to the corresponding performance obligation. I think that is, to me, from my perspective, is the crux of this whole analysis. Shika, correct me if I'm wrong, though. That's correct, actually. This uh, commission's paid amount could be my same box where RER sits on if my financials are in the same box, or it could be some different uh, box also or different application also where I'm, I'm doing my commissions calculations or commissions management, right? So uh, I just need what is the total commissions paid in that particular month, which are associated to these transactions which are going into RER, basically. Yeah. Right. Why why I'm saying which are going into RR because we are doing this uh, weightage. We are applying this percentage of weightage by taking the amounts from performance obligations, the revenue amounts from, from performance mm -hmm. obligations. And that's why uh, I'm saying that just take those percent what is uh, going into right. RR. Right. Because ostensibly what you and Julio pointed out early on was I may be paying commissions on an event based item that doesn't matter, right? This is all about those ratably or over time ones or something that's happening in the future and being able to match that up with the timing of the revenue um, from a, a revenue recognition 606 or IFRS 15 perspective, right? Exactly, yes, good, that's good. 
There was one point, John, I wanted to bring up as well is mm -hmm. people always ask us when they talk to us about these top, this topic is what, what do companies usually elect? And I would say nine out of the 10 companies usually elect the portfolio approach. Now, mm -hmm. there are companies that do it on a sales order level, but I would say the portfolio level approach is the most common. And I think in, in the ones that we talked to, John, in the large telecoms with multiple level commission plans, we see them doing this approach. And you know, if we could say that, maybe this is where this is why we actually built this tool, right, John? No, absolutely. We built it because many of our customers, not only were they coming to it from a commissions perspective, but um, you know, costs, right? And we, we were able to do that through COPA and some other integrations. And again, we'll we'll we've highlighted those in the past, we'll continue, but absolutely. Um, not only that, but you know, they were asking us because we've done 80 to 100 of these projects. What's everybody else doing? And Julio, you hit the nail on the head with that. You know, nine out of 10 um, customers are are doing the portfolio approach. But let's, you know, that's a great segue to the next thing, which is, you know, what are some of the assumptions and for commissions at the portfolio level? And maybe we can talk a little bit in a moment about um why you might want to do this and um you know you do have an alternative of course many companies or not many a number of companies have chosen to do it at a transaction level but that's uh, challenging right yeah i think shaker since you're the solution architect for this 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 uh this solution maybe you can go through the assumptions with the audience yep so as, as we spoke right so we are taking that data uh, per period and uh, because it's a monthly uh, we are taking that commissions paid amounts that's why the first assumption would be all my operational transactions are executed and the invoices are processed so basically whatever the source of commissions amount for that particular month to be paid are completed in that month is the first assumption uh, this process will start only after that. So basically, we can say that this is a month and close process. Yeah. And then um, the next one is the change modifications uh, on this particular, uh, on these transactions. So we cannot apply, since this is a portfolio approach, and this is not a contract by contract approach. So when, when there is some cancellation happens or some credit is issued or some uh, commissions is reversed out on that commissions agent or sales agent. So those uh, for, uh, modifications cannot be applied to the original transactions because it is challenging to track back to that original transaction uh, since it is portfolio. Uh, and we are applying the, uh, we are dividing the commissions amount using weightage uh, of the revenue, right? So uh, that's why uh, what we do is, uh, what we followed is uh, we applied all those credits or the negative transactions again in the same month where in which it occurred. Uh, and we reduced the total amount to be amortized in that particular month. So basically, uh, when, we, when we say that com uh, we calculate the commission's amount paid, it is actually amount paid, including the credits. It does consider the credits also there. So yeah, and then, well, let's let's talk about that, Julio. Let's that's a great point, and let's let's talk highlight that for a moment because I know that question came up a couple of times in conversations we have with customers, right? Because this is, you know, I had asked the question at one point, you know, what about the fact that you have pluses and minuses and all of these? And the reality is, it's because we're taking on a net basis at the end of each period that all of that is automatically accounted for anyway within the the process of the netting, if you will, of the commissions. Is that, Shaker, is that, Shaker and Julio, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, because exactly. what, that's what, you know, what, where Shaker, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was, I, I was gonna say that, so Shaker actually has the right foundation. He doesn't care what happened during the month. He is looking at, at the end of the month, this is why this is a month and close process. He is looking at what has been paid, what has been paid to the, to the uh, so therefore, John, you are correct. 
it's a net basis they're looking at. So I think that that actually wipes out a lot of the complexities of looking at the credits and true up and all this stuff. Interesting question. All right, so I have an interesting question and we'll start with you, Julio, and we'll see. How do we deal with commissions paid to multiple entities on a single deal whose revenue is contracted to one specific entity? How do you, uh, well, I guess, well, I think this is more of a, a system question for Shaker, but from, from my perspective is, how would you deal with a commissions paid to multiple entities on a single deal? Well, again, the first thing you have to basically, basically go through all the, the, you know, the nine steps, understand what is being paid, what is the correct expense amount related to the revenue contract. But if you think about the, um, the specific entities, I'll leave that to shake that answer. I can, yeah, I can take that. Up. So, yes. So if we, uh, whatever commissions amount is paid into multi, for the multiple entities in same deal, it will be divided into uh, entities the same way how we will divide the revenue into those entities. So whatever portion, you know, whatever weightage of revenue will go to each entity, the same portion, same, uh, same weightage will be applied on the commissions amount and that amount will go to that entity for the capitalization. Okay, so for example, in, in the case where we might have a, a large sale from a company like GE Energy, let's say, right? We did a project with them not you know a few years ago where they might be selling a um, a step down station, and there are it's an overall sale through a specific uh, organization in GE, but multiple business units within that might get credit uh, and commissions based on the selling process. We would do that by identifying. Uh, the POBs, if you will, and who gets credit for that? Is that is that the way that would work? Yeah, basically, uh, it depends, uh, John, because uh, if mm -hmm. the commissions is paid uh, overall the sales value to the external agent, then it depends on how we are dividing that revenue, right? And in, if it is internal, then also whatever commissions is paid in that from that entity, that entity will uh, amortize that much amount for that uh, of the commission, right? So it's always goes, uh, it should, uh, the thumb rule is, it should always go uh, along with the percentage of revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. And uh, uh, for the person who asked, if you want to follow up, you know, certainly uh, send me uh, an email and we'll, we'll follow up on that, that item as well. So with yeah. that in mind, um, commissions accounting at the uh, sales order level, maybe we can uh, touch on that quickly uh, before we wrap up, Julio? Yes, yeah, so some customers actually are doing this based on you know, Microsoft Excel, or they're trying to see if they can automate this as well. This is a little more complex, obviously, because what you have to do is, if you, in, if you have millions of sales orders, you have to do the accounting for commissions accounting individually for each mm -hmm. sale. So you're not taking the practical experience. And as we said earlier, most companies, because they don't want to deal with the complexity and the granularity of having to take every sales order and do the accounting for commissions in them, they've taken the portfolio approach. However, you know, it would be a project that would entail going through the same process, which is understanding your commission plans, knowing exactly where the commission plans come from, knowing what is the related commission expense. And lastly, trying to automate that process by saying, okay, for this sales order, it's going to be this uh, automation process of allocating three years, five years, six years, but it's a pretty complex project, John, I have to say. Absolutely, but even more to the point of having a tool like RAR becomes even more important um, for something like that, because can you imagine trying to do hundreds if not thousands of these every every week or month um, you certainly would want to invest the time and effort into a tool like rar and and you know we certainly can help customers like this uh, do that so <clears throat> all right so with that in mind i want to thank everybody for joining julio and shaker before we wrap up uh, and finish any 
comments from your perspective? Any advice you want to give folks before we, we wrap it up? Uh, this is Julio. My, my only advice is, you know, probably take a look at the presentation, look at the nine steps. And like I said, as, as an accountant, I'm always amazed at the IP at Bramasol and making these things more automated, which is what we hear our customers want to do now in the optimization phase of the RevRec and revenue accounting projects is how do we automate this thing? And I think Ramsol has a good product that can help them do that. Awesome. Shaker. Thank you, Julio. Shaker, any thoughts before we wrap up? As a solution uh, expert, I will just suggest if you are using ARIA and if you are following this portfolio approach for commissions, then this is the right way to go forward. Actually. Okay. It will reduce lots of efforts from the spreadsheet and all other applications. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you both. Uh, this has been, I have to tell you, this, this hour flew by for me, and this was a great subject. So thank you both. Hopefully all of you, thank you for all of the questions. We got a lot of questions out there. Couldn't answer them all. Um, but please follow up for those of you who have questions. We'll be glad to talk with you about them. Uh, and I want to thank you all. Uh, look forward to our next webinars. Uh, coming up in February. Uh, so check those out. We'll be focusing on Lessor Accounting, uh, which is a unique solution in which we've been able to use SAP RAR and SAP CLM to solve uh, leasing uh, solutions for Lessor Accounting, uh, both for your operating leases as well as your sales type leases. We'll also be doing another uh, session, a rescheduled session on project accounting. Uh, so you'll you'll hear from Julio again and several of our deep experts on that. So thank everybody for being here. Uh, I want to thank all of my both of my guests, and I want to ask everybody out there, please stay safe, uh, please stay positive. We will get through this new world uh, together. And Bramasol is here to help you make sense out of your finances uh, and help you on the road towards um, becoming a 21st century. Uh, company. So thank you all again. Make it a great day and we look forward to seeing you on future events. Bye-bye.